Hashem Hashem Naseh V'Natzliach, Shir Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are back here on our Tuesday night Igeret Agra series. Um, tonight's you will be for uh, uh, my, uh, the Atzlacha Rabah Refua Shlema for my dear wife, uh, Levana, uh, Rabbanit Levana, Bat uh, Sarah. Uh, also for uh, my dear mother, uh, uh, Rabbanit Doris, uh, Bat uh, Jora. Uh, also for a uh, refuah shlema for a very dear friend of ours, uh, Rivka, but uh, Sarah and uh, Tinok ben uh, Rivka. And uh, refuah shlema for uh, David ben Esriya, Orit um, bat Ilana, Talia bat Sarah, Itro ben Avraham, uh, Rabanit Sarah bat Anat, Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Uh, Pnina bat uh, Shulamit and uh, also for a uh, Atzlacha Rabba for uh, Ruven Chaim ben Pala Parel uh, and Zivug Agun, also Netanel Yosef ben Avraham, also for Zivug Agun and uh, Marsha bat Julie, Ayla bat Marsha, Samuel ben Marsha, Sephas ben Marsha, Alexander ben Marsha, Louis ben Marsha, Shaul ben Farzane Yitro ben Avraham, Oshri ben Doris, Gabi ben Doris, Elad ben Doris, David ben Esriya, and uh, Joshua ben Noach. Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam, Bekol Mikol Kol, Chaim Arukim, Shlemim, Eliyim Torah, Mitzvot, Gmiut Chasadim, them and all of the other wonderful people that uh, continue to help us and contribute to all of the uh, different uh, causes that we have, Baruch Hashem. Uh, I see that the uh, campaign for the uh, free uh, box of CDs is uh, continuing to go well for anyone who hasn't gotten themselves a box of these CDs uh, and you're located in the U.S., go to bhtorah.org, get yourself one of these boxes. It's uh, the most popular CDs that we've uh, ever had. Uh, we've uh, given out, uh, we've reached probably close to a million people uh, with these CDs and uh, several million people with these uh, lectures. They've impacted quite a few people. Uh, this is a it's $170 value and we're giving them out uh, Hashem for free for anyone that wants to uh, you know uh, distribute them in their uh, community uh, This is a nice box. It's not too many. You have uh, 25 double CDs You give it out to your uh, friends community and so on especially before Tisha B'Av bhtorah.org and uh, anyone who can't give them out uh, for whatever reason but wants to contribute like some smart people uh, have uh, have done uh, and they become f complete partners uh, that even get more merit than the people that are giving them uh, the people that are donating to them you could also donate on that same website bhtorah.org uh, with that being said we have Baruch Hashem a very special shiul uh, this is for all of you dear mothers all of you dear mothers and all of you uh, dear uh, fathers uh, and all of uh, you uh, dear uh, young uh, men and women that want to be fathers and mothers, there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, relevant teachings that the Gaomi Vilna is going to be teaching us today, Bezat Hashem, uh, about chinuch, about chinuch of the, uh, of, of the kids. Uh, things that uh, I would say that if it was said today uh, in your uh, typical community, uh, most likely the person will get arrested. Uh, why? Because we live, we live in a very uh, lefty, liberal-minded type of uh, world today. Hence the reason why as soon as children do not uh, get what they want, they decide that the first thing to do is to destroy property. Now, if it's just destroying their own house, their own toys, and things of that nature, uh, that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world because the damage is contained. The problem is that these kids have grown up and uh, they've uh, started, uh, you know, building organizations, wicked organizations, communistic organizations like Black Lives Matters and uh, all these other types of organizations where as soon as they don't get what they want, or even if they are, they still do it anyway and they decide to destroy public property. All of these people, all of these wicked, disgusting people that uh, decide to take uh, other people's property and, and destroy it for their, uh, for their own pleasure... Uh, or to uh, voice their opinion, whatever, whatever the, uh, their so-called demented message is, this is the, uh, the fruits of the labor of their parents. And it's the fruits of the labor of the wicked society that we live in today. 
Now, of course, this type of stuff doesn't necessarily happen in every country. Uh, in fact, it doesn't happen in almost anywhere uh, outside of uh, the United States. I mean, some of this stuff happens on a smaller scale in, uh, in some other countries, but nowhere near the amount of damage uh, that has happened in the U.S., the most uh, wealthy financially uh, you know, country in the world, but most likely the most uh, morally poor country in the world at the same time. Uh, and uh, we see that because of how many lefty liberals, anti-Torah, anti-truth uh, people are uh, simply running the, uh, the government, society, corporate America, and so on. Now, of course, we're not going to be able to change all of that tonight, perhaps with a lecture. Kadosh uh, Baruch whose hand is in everything. But nonetheless, we could all start with by looking in the mirror and seeing what kind of parents are we? What kind of parents uh, are we going to be in order to know what kind of children we're going to have? Uh, now, of course, in today's world, that uh, when you tell people, listen, if, if your children uh, don't behave well, you have to rebuke them. Immediately, people start cringing. If you tell them, listen, if they really break the rules, you can even hit them. Automatically, you're going to lose the attention of, of, of uh, you know, at least half of the people. And most likely, they're going to start going against you as if you're some type of Hamas terrorist. And the reality is, is that parents that, uh, you know, that do not know how to parent, do not know when it's actually time to hit the children, they're evil parents. They're evil parents. If, if you don't hit your kids, if it's necessary, and I don't mean hit them to break their bones, but hit them in order to rebuke them, in order to get them to change direction in their life uh, at that moment, uh, then in essence, what you're creating is a new Hitler. Uh, and the reason why is because a child needs to know that the world is not hefker. It's not just for them to do whatever they want. And sometimes a child has to uh, be treated in such a way that uh, it's, it's beyond talking. Now, of course, this is some of the details we're going to go into tonight. When it's proper, when it's not proper, what's the point of all of it? Who's really saying this? Is this some type of uh, barbarian mentality or, or otherwise? I mean, technically, if you turn on uh, the news of Tum'ah in the world today, you may be uh, fortunate enough to, uh, to hear one of the talks of one of the liberal-minded of today that actually has an entire organization telling society that they are morally unjust because they're not asking their babies, their toddlers, for permission before removing their diaper in order to change them. There's actually people that get airtime on television that say that we are supposed to ask the children, the babies, for, for permission to remove their diaper in, in order to change the baby who does not know how to talk and, or communicate or, 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 or even go into a, uh, into a bathroom. But they think that it's morally uh, unjust. Or you have sometimes people think that they're supposed to... a uh, uh, treat their children like they're adults uh and the reality is quite the opposite quite the opposite and uh it's important to know that uh, the sources of all the information that we have provided uh, we're gonna provide them like we always do uh, but uh first and foremost the person needs to know that this is what da torah is this is the opinion of the torah and there's a uh, there's a track record of different chachamim, different tzaddikim that followed, and different chachamim, different tzaddikim that made a mistake and erred, uh, and 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 saw the the outcome of their uh, action or misaction during their life, which will you know the Torah provides, as the Torah is the only unbiased document on planet Earth where it shows us the good and the flaws in the greatest people of all time, and this 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 too is in there. Now, the Gaon Vilna has been telling us over the last several weeks of how we have to honor Shabbat, how we have to uh, make sure that we have Onik Shabbat, and uh, when it comes to uh, getting the kids on board, when it comes to giving Chinuch, uh, discipline of the kids, the number one source of, uh, of information should be from the Musar books. And the Musar books also includes the stories of the Tzadikim, uh, stories of our sages, stories of our patriarchs, stories of our matriarchs. You know, you have Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, uh, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, all types of extraordinary uh, men that lived 
uh, throughout history that are listed in our Tanakh, and of course all of our tzaddikim, uh, Rabbi Akiva and his and his students, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, uh, Rabbi Mir Baranes, and so on. And also you have the modern day sages, or more modern day, uh, the last eight hundred years, the Rishonim, the Rambam, the Ramban, uh, the Arizal, the Galmi Vilna, of course, uh, or even uh, the uh, the ones that are still living with us uh, now, or just passed on. Uh, not too long ago, like uh, Rav Yashiv, uh, Rav Ovadia, the Stipe anyone that studies the works, the, 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 the uh, bios of these tzedikim, when you do it, you should do yourself and your children a favor and read it out loud so they could hear it. Even if they're not necessarily in tune like you are, uh, still, they'll hear a few things here and there, and surely something will seep into those precious little hearts. Uh, it's always very good to have a uh, you know a uh, a book a bio of a tzaddik that you're reading at all times. We have a custom in our family that uh, you know we read uh, these specific books on Shabbat. On Shabbat, I take one of the sipurei tzaddikim, one of the bios of the tzaddikim, and I read it out loud uh, with my uh, dear Rabbanit, my wife. And uh, Baruch Hashem, sometimes the kids sit in, sometimes not. But also during the week, during the week we have a uh, you know whole library. Uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, of, of different uh, stories for of, of the tzaddikim. Uh, different stories of the tzaddikim. There is a countless, countless stories that Am Yisrael has. No nation in the world, as great as they are in number, no nation in the world has as many extraordinary people as the Jewish nation. And this is factual. It's not theoretical and it's not a, uh, anything else. Simply, no other nation has great people like Am Yisrael has throughout all of our uh, uh, generations. And one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself and for your children is to constantly read your kids stories of the sages, of the tzaddikim. So sometimes, you know, the bios uh, that are, uh, you know, thick, five, six, seven, eight hundred page books, perhaps they're going to be a little bit too much for, for a little three, four, five year old kid or eight year old kid. But nonetheless, there are smaller versions, kids' versions of those same stories. Get those, get as many of them as possible and read them out loud to your kids as often as possible. And don't worry, after you finish reading it, you can read it again. Kids like to see or hear the same thing 500 times and uh, they, they enjoy it just the same each time. And one of the greatest things that uh, you could uh, ever hear your kid uh uh, say is when you want to say, hey, listen, you want me to tell you a story? You start telling them a story, and towards the, at some point during that story, depending on how much, uh, how much manners uh, your kids had, they tell you, you know, Abba, that's actually in the uh, story uh, number five in the series of such and such, meaning he heard the story, but he's okay with hearing it again, and he remembers it. One of the greatest things in the world that you could have from a kid, but nonetheless, this is one of our customers in our house, and Baruch Hashem, it's helped tremendously. Uh, both the parents and the kids, and uh, it's good for a family to always have. Now, of course, in addition to the stories of the tzaddikim, also have a uh, the Musar books that you teach your kids. There are adult version of Musar books, the Mesilat Yesharim, the Chovot Levavot, Pirkei Avot, our lectures, and so on. But nonetheless, there's also kids' versions. There's a Pirkei Avot for kids. There is a all types of books that teach Musar, uh, that are for the kids. And I've, I've told you there is a, uh, a very well-known artist by name of Gadi Palak that is uh, a uh, Talmit Chacham as well, an extraordinary artist. He himself has done art for several great Musar books that are for children. I personally think they're, 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 they're good for adults. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there are lots and lots of works that can help your chinuch, your, your education and discipline in your house, uh, grow with each day and there should never be a day where Torah is not in your house and I don't mean just Torah for the father or Torah just for the mother but rather Torah for the whole house and a Torah that the kids get in school is simply not enough they need to get some more from the parents even if it's only five minutes trust me when I tell you one of the biggest difficulties that I personally deal with in my life that I don't spend time with enough time with my kids I, I, this, this is one of the most difficult tikkunim that I have. And the reason why is because I spend a lot of time with Hashem's kids. And uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing. But I know that even if, 
you know, I would love to study with my kids for hours or play with them for hours or days or weeks and so on and always consider constantly taking a vacation for an extended period of time. But of course, life doesn't take a vacation and people's problems don't take a vacation. So you have to do what you have to do. But still, if we can get that five minutes or that 10 minutes or that 15 minutes to tell a story, to eat together with a story or something like that, that at least keeps everything at bay. And sometimes that's all you can get, but at the very least, you need to get that. You need to do it for yourself and you need to do it for your kids. But sometimes some people forget to do this or never learn that they need to do this. And uh, they uh, think that the kids are supposed to grow up by themselves and they're all going to learn by themselves. Perhaps they're going to get the education from the motorcycle club down the street or maybe they're going to get their education from some gangster that lives, uh, you know, in a uh, in, in, in cell block uh, eight. Or maybe they're going to get their education from some classmate that's here today, gone tomorrow. You know, you never know who you're going to get your education from if you don't get it from your parents. So sometimes that kid is not going to be peaches. What happens? What do you do in a situation like that when you have a kid that's not exactly an easy kid? And no kid is really easy, but nonetheless... Each one, Baruch Hashem, has his own Kedusha. So what do we do in such a situation where we have these Musar books we, uh, we didn't teach or we taught and perhaps they're not listening? What do we do? This is the section of where the Gaomi Vilna is going to expand into at this point, telling his wife and, of course, telling us by default. Now, he continues and he says, in this first section, the Gaomi Vilna says something that in today's world is as politically incorrect as can be. And like I said before, if he said this in public, in a synagogue today, or some type of communal event, it is very possible that one of the Reshaim in the community will call the cops on him. Almost certain. Why? It's what he says. And so you should, not, you should guide them constantly using the Musar works, the same Musar works that we talked about just now and last week, but for curses, for false oaths, for falsehood, you know, lying, you should be prepared to hit them hard and don't have mercy on them at all because God forbid parents will be punished severely for the misbehavior of their children. Here, the Gaon Mivilna is as clear as he can be about his understanding of how to raise your children, that when certain things happen, corporal punishment is a necessary evil. It is a necessary thing that you need to do in order to raise your kids to become righteous people, ethically righteous people, biblically righteous people, and most importantly, a uh, a toilet uh, a something that's uh, good for the world now many parents do not believe in hitting today of course in our days hitting was standard in fact whether you were secular or religious most likely you got a few trachs here and there if you weren't such a good kid especially if your mom loved you the more she loved you, the more she hit you sometimes because you want to make sure you stay in the right direction. We laugh about it all the time. Anytime my brothers and I get together, which unfortunately is not often enough because we all live in different states and we're all grown up and we have our own families. But anytime we get together or we talk, we laugh about it all the time when we were kids. Oh, you remember such and such when we were 30, 40 years ago when you did such and such and Ima took her uh, slipper and threw it and somehow it hit you? You know, it's, you remember that and you laugh about it. Now, of course, you didn't laugh about it at the time. But nonetheless, when you get older, you understand sometimes you need a slipper to hit you in the face, you know, in order to get to the, the message. But today, if a mother takes a slipper and throws it at her kid, it's very possible that kid's calling the cops and that mom's going to spend a couple of days in jail and most likely lose that kid forever. It's very possible. In fact, it's even possible that if the mother even yells at the kid, 
and embarrasses him next to his friends very possible that kid is going to go into the family safe take the gun out and shoot her in the face and kill her it's very possible today there is an entire section in prison in america today and i believe it's probably the only country that has it but i'm not sure about that fact that's just my own guesstimate there's an entire section the entire section in prisons today just for children that committed murder and there are children that are literally children i'm not talking about kids that are like 18 20 25 and i'm calling them children literally children 12 13 14 11 serving 50 year sentences for killing people now these kids got their education from somewhere surely they got some of their educations from the chachamim of the video game industry all the sages of the video game industry that teach them that shooting people is a good thing especially if you get the most kills so they got the chachamim the sages of the gaming industry to teach them some of their education and of course their very very uh, intellectual parents professor parents are the ones that bought them this education surely they got some of their education from the very very uh, 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 extraordinary and global industry of pornography surely they got their education from there as well uh and surely they got it from cell block number eight and 12 and 11 and perhaps even their new boyfriend in jail now this rabotai is not exclusive to the non-jews this has been an infiltration into the jewish world the same and not just the jewish world but even in the religious jewish world we have seen time and time again young kids that for all intents and purposes had the whole world in their hands turn into gangsters out of nowhere but of course it's not out of nowhere of course it's not out of nowhere but it seems to everybody out of nowhere because no one actually ever thought that a video game could cause that much harm to lead a kid to shoot up a school no one ever thought that watching pornography could literally deform a person's mind and hormonal system to such an extent that that person will rape somebody or perhaps even uh you know commit pedophilia while he himself is a child i have stories i have stories of young people young people that come to me crying telling me about how they were raped as children and it's not always what you would think it's not always the teacher or the uncle or the brother which is usually always close people I've had one of the most one of the most shocking stories of the of my life that I had to literally took me a few to this day I'm still shocked about it literally one young man Baruch Hashem Baal Tshuva Tzadik does a lot of good things today but he had told me himself he was ra- raped as a child five years old for a period of two or three years by who his next door neighbor that was only two years older than him or three years older than him meaning like an eight-year-old kid committed rape and pedophilia for a period of a few years and the parents never knew until they knew this rabotai where did this kid get this education he didn't get it from the tanakh he didn't get it from yeshiva he didn't get it from his rebbe he didn't get it from me he didn't even get it from his parents probably where do you get it from you got it from video games television movies and simply satan himself this Rabotai, what the Gaon Mivilna is telling us right now is there's a time and a place for everything. And sometimes, if your kids break the rules of the house to such an extent where they have become potty mouths, they curse nonstop, they have a filthy mouth, they make f- false swears, say, you know, like the old uh, saying, oh, I swear to, and they say Hashem about everything oh yeah no i didn't take it i swear to hashem they start making all types of oaths like this worse yet they become liars now of course little kids in the beginning they don't understand the the significance of lies and if you don't stop them and you don't tell them the significance they can become a uh, eventually a ponzi schemer they can eventually become a complete criminal yes it all starts with something small the biggest gangsters losers and and destroyers of society didn't start that way even hitler was born as a cute baby but when you don't censor the kids and you don't guide them the right way and you don't rebuke them 
in the appropriate way with the appropriate tools at different times you my friend are going to have a very horrible present to, to give the world when that kid leaves your house and that's why the Gomi Vilna says that for certain certain situations such as curses oaths and falsehood you should be prepared to hit them hard of course the Gaomi Vilna is not referring to hitting them with a closed fist in order to break some bones or perhaps even give them a black eye that's not what he's referring to meaning hit them hard enough where they get the message that this is not going to happen not in this house not while I'm alive it will not happen and if it does something else will be a response and a person needs to know that to give this type of message of fear to the kids is the best expression of love you could ever give them how do I know that's what the Gaumi Vilna says and let's see where he says it one should not hesitate to use the corporal punishment and of course this is not referring to cruel or unfeeling remedy but the opposite needs to be understood that to sit back and allow a child to speak sinfully is the greatest cruelty of all needless to say to act sinfully now again the Shulchan Aruch says that if you see your kid he's a child we're not talking about 13 year old and above for a boy or 12 year old and above for a girl or even a little younger than that talk about literally toddler four five years old six years old before the age of chinuch chinuch usually starts around six before that they're outright monkeys according to the uh, to the benishchai before six years old they're outright monkeys unless you have a very developed kid you have a kid that grew up faster about Hashem you had the blessing to such a thing then perhaps you have to do it much earlier even as early as two years old in some kids but nonetheless you have to understand that they are kids they are your kids but also you have been given a responsibility to take care of their neshama and bring him back to Hashem the same way you got it so but if you see a kid let's say for example he's three four years old she's three four years old and she decides to play with the light on Shabbat obviously she doesn't understand the magnitude of sin she doesn't understand the, the magnitude of playing with the lights electricity and so on or you see her playing with one and she took out of the closet one of the toys that's mukse don't lose your mind in fact in many cases don't say anything the Shukhan Aruch says you see your kid doing certain things that are sin if they're that young don't even have to say anything why because they're not going to get the message first and foremost in many cases number two there's not really much you can do there's not really much you can do of course if you can do things to get them away from the toy or from that uh item then of course do so but don't lose your mind don't treat it as if you just saw your husband drive on Shabbat or as if you just saw one of your uh, adult children eat pig on Yom Kippur don't lose your mind it's a little toddler but that doesn't mean that if they do certain things that have nothing to do with the specific mitzvah of Shabbat and so on but simply they're acting wrong they're acting terrible to say nothing is cruel the Gomi Vilna says and his commentary on Proverbs chapter 27 verse 5 he says that the uh, main motivation that a parent should have when they're chastising their children should be their deep love for the child and therefore the Gaumi Vilna says that the intensity of the rebuke is correlated with the depth of love the chastiser has for the recipient of the rebuke which means that a parent who loves their child more than anyone will resort to the most intense rebuke while someone that's rebuking a different relative most likely will not hit them why because he doesn't love them as strongly as a parent loves their child and even more so the goal says that a person that sees even a brother or a neighbor or a classmate make type of sin you won't even rebuke them at all why 
They don't love them. They like them. They're an acquaintance. They like to invite them for Shabbat to have a uh, nice talk. But love, non-existent there. Non-existent. Now, further, the Gomi Vilna says, in uh, Proverbs 23, verse 17, he says that Shlomo HaMelech, in this verse, is telling the father that when the father punishes, when you, the father, punish your son with the rod in order to direct him onto the right path, know that your loving actions with the mere rod onto the temporal body will supplant the truly hideous fate of the Malche Chabala, the destructive angels, maliciously inflicting otherworldly harm onto the eternal soul, a fate far worse. In so many words, the Gaumi Vilna is saying, you dear father, you dear mother, sometimes you have to hate your kid because your, your kid just did something horrible. Horrible. He just did something that's inexcusable. And you're going to give him a nice chapcha. You're going to give him a nice slap. Now, you may feel bad about doing it because you see your kid crying. You feel bad. Ta -ta -ta, right? Call me says you have nothing to feel bad about. If you did it from love because you care about this kid, your hit, even if it was hard, even if he got uh, hurt a little bit, again, not intentionally trying to you know, kill the kid, your hit is much better, much better than the hit that that child will get from the destructive angels that Hashem will assign to his soul if he continues on this path and dies this way as a sinner because once a person dies a kadosh Baruch Hu has to assign different employees that he has to every neshama if that person is wicked because his parents did not rebuke him know that those hits that he's going to get from those angels of destruction are going to be much much worse than you could ever imagine so in fact what you're doing for him is an act of love Again, because you mean to help him, not because you simply want to hurt somebody or take revenge. Now, the Gaumi Vilna continues even further in uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, where he quotes the Sefer Akedah, which compares the father's rebuke to a woman applying makeup, saying that a woman will seek out the clearest mirror that's possible that's going to show every blemish on her face from the large unsightly ones to the minute speck in order that she appear as beautiful as possible and so too one who truly loves his son the most will scrutinize him closest and see to it that in the end not a blemish remains now of course to some people this may seem barbaric this may seem barbaric this may seem uh, old-fashioned this may seem uh, uncivil and so on and so forth, but you'll see most of the time it's their kids that cause the most amount of problems to them and to society. Now, there's a reason why the children of divorced parents tend to be the most undisciplined kids. They tend to be the most undisciplined kids. Why the most undisciplined kids? Because, unfortunately, because the parents could not consolidate their differences to, and simply separated from each other, what ends up happening is that the parents now, in many cases, share custody. And even if both parents are altogether normal parents, generally speaking, since they're sharing custody, she gets a few days, he gets a few days, or he gets uh, every other weekend, or whatever it is, what ends up happening is that the at least one of the parents, if not both, end up spoiling the kids every single time they see them. But not just when they're little kids and you can't really do much with them other than just buy them toys and, and, and feed them and change them. But even when they're 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, and they get the point, but simply what ends up happening is that since the parents see, listen, I only have two, the weekend with this kid. What am I going to rebuke him? What am I going to yell at him because he doesn't do his homework? Nah, come on, let me just go take him to the ball game. Let me just go hang out with them a little bit. Let me go play with them. Do, 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 do. 
What ends up happening is that the kid only sees playtime with both parents and is simply never rebuked. That kid ends up becoming a little terrorist to society because he doesn't understand that there has to be limitations. I've met quite a few of these children in my life and I've met them also as adults. And I remember working with some of them. And many of them are simply grown children. Even when they're in their 30s and 40s and 50s, not very much has changed from the time they were eight years old. They still think they can do whatever they want and they cry when they don't get what they want. And it's a very, very sick type of person, horrible husbands, horrible wives, horrible people in society. But nonetheless, this is not always the case. Some of them end up becoming very, you know, upstanding people, decent human beings. But nonetheless, many, many cases come, you know, that, that come that be, and become problematic usually are from broken homes because they don't have some type of dominating figure in their life that's going to give them some type of decent direction. Or sometimes the parents stay married, but they're both degenerates. You know, they have parents that are losers, that are, that are drug addicts, that are party animals, and so on. And obviously, this in itself is a disaster. So, of course, there's an enormous responsibility on each and every one of us. If we're going to be parents, we have to be responsible, not just to have bring the kid to life, but make that kid know enough about life that they could live it the right way and not become a destructive source uh, force of uh, in, in society now where do we see this in the torah where do we see this in the torah if you go to shlomo amedech's proverbs in chapter 31 it says the following the words of Lemuel the king Lemuel was a, another name for Shlomo Melech, King Solomon the words of Lemuel the king the prophecy with which his mother disciplined him what is it my son and what is it O son of my womb and what is it O son of my vows Give not your strength to women and let your conduct not destroy the protocol of kings. It's not proper for kings who belong to God. It's not proper for kings to drink much wine and for princes to imbibe judgment, uh, imbibe strong drink, lest he drink and forget the statue of the Torah and pervert judgment of all the children of the poor. What is all this? The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 70b, gives us commentary of what this is all about. As we learn time and time again, we cannot survive a single verse in the Torah or the Tanakh without our oral Torah. Because if you read it over there, you see Lemuel the king. If it wasn't for our Gemara, we wouldn't know who Lemuel the king is. Why? doesn't say anywhere that uh, King Solomon had the name Lemuel. We only know from the oral Torah. And then we hear about this rebuke that he's getting about this Lemuel. He's getting about not to you know be uh, with all these kings, not to forget the Torah. Okay, great. So I'm the king. Can I just do whatever I want? What's the meaning of this? Why is this a proverb? Why is this a proverb even? So the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 70b, says the following. Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Lemuel is a name for Shlomo Melech. And this whole section is about how Shlomo Melech was rebuked by his mother, Batya. Batya the Tzadika. Admonishing him, telling him, What my son, what my son, son of my womb. Why 
Are you doing sinful things that brand you as my son? What do you mean, my son? Who else is he going to be? Somebody else's son. Everybody knows that your father, David Melech, had Yirat Shamaim, was a God fearing Jew. So they will now say that all of your sins are because of your mother. What sins are these? What are all these sins? What sins is Shlomo Amelach doing? The Midrash says that when, Shl- Sh- when Shlomo Amelach decided he's going to marry a woman of every nation in order to bring Mashiach, because there will be world peace. One of the women that he married was the daughter of Pao. Of course, he converted her to Judaism and married her. Now, some of these women were not honest converts and brought their idolatry with them. She was one of them. And this Reshait Bat Paro, the Gemara says that when he married her, Akadosh Baruch Hu brought punishment to the world, decided that the Bet HaMikdash will be destroyed. But needless to say, this woman, when they first got married, she wanted all of the time of Shlomo Melech, despite the fact that he had other wives and so on, she cared less. She wanted all of his attention. So what'd she do? She, when he would spend time with her, she wanted him to stay there. So she had the people in the uh, castle make the bedroom, have a uh, the, the uh, ceiling, the entire ceiling, look like the sky at night, full of stars and, and, and so on. So when Shlomo would wake up at some point, he would still look up and it would look like it's night. So he would stay asleep. Now, this may seem like not such a big problem. It's kind of cute even, right? You know, you stay, you want to stay with your husband. What's wrong with that? Problem is that it's completely selfish. Why? Because Shlomo Melech was the only one that had the keys to the Bet HaMikdash. He had the keys to the Bet HaMikdash. So when he stayed with her that one night and did not wake up on time they couldn't open the bet mikdash all of the sacrifices are on hold everything is on hold when batya bat paro when, ba, when batya not batya bat sheva i'm sorry i've been saying the wrong name this whole time bat sheva the tzadika when bat sheva which was all already an older woman when bat sheva was a uh, uh um already found this out she's already an older woman she finds this out that the Bet HaMikdash, the Bet HaMikdash is not being opened because her son didn't show up. She picks herself up, goes to where Shlomo Melech is in the bedroom. Everyone's scared to death. He's the king. Even the animals bow to him. Literally, Shlomo Melech was the most powerful king in the world. He was not just the king of human beings in all the countries. He was the king literally of the creation. Hashem gave him power and wisdom to be king over the demons, king over the animals, king over the birds, king over everything. So literally, when a lion or a zebra or whatever would pass by, they would stop and bow to him. That's that's the if anyone that reads the uh, uh, the uh, the midrashim and the gemara and everything else that's written about Shlomo Melech, it's unbelievable, literally unbelievable. Even the uh, the fantasy island of, of, of Hollywood has not made such a movie about Shlomo Amelech and all the true glory that he had in his time. There was so much money at the time of Shlomo Amelech that literally gold became uh, like sand. There was He had an entire city of gold. And this type of power, you would think, I don't have to wake up early. I could just give the key to somebody else. What's the big deal if I'm late one day? When Bat Sheva is... Sadika mother heard this. She went to the room, entered the room, got him out of bed, got him out of bed, tied him to the pole, and started hitting him. Started hitting him, crying. Saying all of this. What, my son? What, the son of my womb, the one that I carried for nine months? The son of my vows. What is this, my son? Why are you doing this? Everyone knew that your father is a tzaddik. He's a Yeresh And they're going to blame me. 
as the reason why you're doing this. That you're spending time with this girl over here, with this wife of yours, instead of being in the Bet HaMikdash, opening it. And she starts hitting him and crying and hating him. And then she continues and she says, the Gemara in uh, Sanhedrin 70b says, all the other women of your father's household would no longer see the king's face once they conceived, meaning they stopped being intimate with King David as soon as they became pregnant. But I pushed and entered his chamber to be intimate with him, even during my pregnancy, because I knew that this would be good for you. It's good for the baby, according to the Torah. This is uh, not just the Kabbalah, this is Gemara, that there's a certain benefit to the baby when the parents are intimate during the pregnancy. But of course, there is a uh, explanation of the first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester. One is uh, neutral, one is really good, and one is actually bad. So, person needs to know. But of course, she says, I, while all of the other queens, because King David was married to 18 women, all the other queens, as soon as they got pregnant, that's it, they were happy, that's it, their son's going to be, you know, a prince, perhaps the next king. They don't need to be with King David anymore. They already achieved their life's goal. I went and I made sure that I, sp- I was intimate with your father because I knew it was good for you as a baby. And what do you do for this, my son? My son of my vows. How can you indulge after such vows that I took before you were born? For all the women of your father's household will take the following vow. Let me have a son fit to be a king. That's all they wanted. They wanted a son that's going to be a king. I pledged to do specific deeds, to take on certain mitzvot on myself. Why? So that my son will be robust and filled with Torah knowledge, fit for prophecy. That's all I wanted. I didn't need you to be a king. I wasn't praying for you to be a king. I wanted you to be a Talmud Chacham, a scholar, a tzaddik, to, 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 to have so much Torah, to be so full of Torah that you would be gifted even with prophecy. This is what Batsheva was telling our son Shlomo Amelech. What are you doing being in the company of kings who drink wine? and become intoxicated, saying, why do we need God? That's the reason why it was called Lemuel. Lama Lanuel. Why would we need a, uh, a God? Meaning this Lemuel was really a, 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 a name of rebuke that Shlomo Melech had for this one mistake. And she's hitting him as he's tied up. Now, if you do this today to a grown man, your son, if he is in a position of power, he's a general of some kind, he's an executive, he's a president of America, whatever he is, if he loves you, simply he'll untie himself and uh, perhaps institute you in some type of uh, mental institution, maybe pay for your own private island so you, you would never be able to leave, or, you know, he'll do some type of favor to you that, you know, simply you won't die. But if he doesn't love you, most likely that'll be, you know, he'll have to write, say Kaddish about you from that day on. What do people do? The parent, what does Shlomo Melech do? His mom is hitting him, telling him, what are you doing? What does he do? What, what, kind, of, what kind of response does Shlomo Melech have? Shlomo HaMelech, Chacham Yikol Adam, the wisest man of all time. As his mom is hitting him, he says, Eshet chayil miyimtza v'rachok v'pnimicha Batach bale bala v'shala lo echsar He sings to his ima and he creates the song on the spot, a woman of valor. The woman of valor who can find far beyond pearls is her value. 
A husband's heart relies on her, and he shall lack no fortune. This is the famous song the Jews sing on Friday nights on Kiddush. If they merit to be righteous women, the song is about them. But even if they don't merit to be righteous women, the song is still valid because it's a song about the Torah itself. But nonetheless, Shlomo Amedech wrote this song about his dear mother Bathsheba, the tzaddika, while she was hitting and rebuking him. Saying, you are the righteous one. You're right. A hundred million, billion, zillion percent. Right. I made a mistake. And he sings the song to his mother. This Rabutai is as clear a day example of what the good chinuch, what kind of results it has. Now, unfortunately, not all of King David's children got the same type of chinuch. We have a couple of examples of some of the kids of the King David, David Melech's, that didn't get the good chinuch. In the book of Kings, chapter uh, in uh, in uh, book of Kings one, chapter one, verse number five, we learn about one of K- King David's sons named Adonoya ben Chagit. And Adoniah decides, even though his father is alive and has not decided who's going to be the king, he goes against the kinghood and says, what? I'm king now. Meaning not only is he going against the eventual king, which is Shlomo Melech, but he goes against his own father, the king, while he's alive. Why? King David never rebuked him. King David never rebuked him. He ended up becoming a Moed Bamalchut, going against the kinghood during his life. And if that was not bad enough, we also have Avshalom. Avshalom did the same thing, but took it a step even further and tried killing King David. Why? King David never rebuked him, never told him no. So when Shlomo Melech tells us in Tehilim that a person needs to make sure that they have the right discipline on their children and when you lack discipline on your children you're creating a disaster he's not telling us just from his wisdom which is far beyond any man but he's also telling us from his experience in his own household he saw siblings his stepbrothers not get the same chinuch that he got and ended up becoming murderers ended up becoming rapists ended up becoming terrible horrible people so the wisest man of all time tells us i got the chinuch for my dear mother but sheva not just during childhood even when i grew up i had honor of my mother that even when she was hitting me when i was an adult with the shukhan says you know to hit the kid when he's an adult lest he hit you back i had so much fear of my mother that even as a king i knew she was right she was a hundred million percent right and i sang her a song that sang in every bite be israel on every shabbat eshet chayil all started with the song about my mother one of the great customs that i learned from my uh, rebbe's father Rav Chaim, is when you sing the song of eshet chayil on friday night sing it to your wife don't sing it like you're just trying to get to the food sing it sing it and make sure the kids see that you're singing it for your wife It's very beautiful for children to see their parents have the appropriate type of affection. And not just like, eh, pass the salt, eh, give me this, eh, eh. It's very good that the kids see affection from the parents, appropriate affection. They see that the parents love each other. Kids that see their parents love each other learn how to love. Kids that do not see their parents love each other and all they see their parents 
asking each other for stuff all they learn how to do is how to be roommates and if that they don't learn anything when little kids see their parents expressing love for each other they understand what love is they understand that this is what they want this is what they want unfortunately in today's world many parents don't do this or they do this inappropriately they don't do it they simply treat each other as if she's his servant and she and he's her slave just get me this get me that do this do that buy this buy that fine those are all things that are necessary but if it's just that and there's no affection ever the kids don't know why why should i ever you know maybe i should just get a slave instead of uh you know that doesn't answer back or on the other hand there's some disgusting people that show too much affection where they start doing uh all types of inappropriate things in front of their kids and so on and so forth and unfortunately i've met some of those people too and they're the kids end up becoming very very sick kids spiritually sick kids very very spiritually sick where uh, many times the parents watch certain things on television or on some type of screens pornography and so on even if the kids are in the room and it's much like you you think you think about it and you want to vomit you want to vomit but this actually exists in the world this exists in the world and unfortunately it exists even in the Jewish world why there's no Torah in such a house when there's no Torah in such a house a fire will consume it not just the fire of physical fire but fire of the Satan himself will destroy such a house now the beauty of Shlomo Melech's house is that the house had an enormous amount of Torah both from the father and the mother but Sheva loved the Kadosh Baruch Hu, loved the Torah, and was an extraordinary tzaddika. Extraordinary tzaddika. And she merited to be the mother of the Mashiach. Mashiach comes from her. Comes from David Melech to Shlomo, all the way to Mashiach of today. So, Bat Sheva was not just a, uh, oh, she got lucky. She was an extraordinary woman. And when she saw that her son, was erring was going against the shem she did not hold back king or no king may he kill me not kill me it's better off already to die to add than to have a kid that goes against the shem because everybody understands that if you give your kid the right chinuch you're much more likely to get a better product in the end now the gaumi vilna continues telling us all types of scary things about what happens if the parents do not rebuke their kids and in the sefer even shlema in chapter six alakha number one he says that a person needs to supervise his children closely making sure that they're following the correct path because the parents of the children whose behavior is corrupted will be punished by heaven severely and even if the father is righteous and he has good deeds protect him from direct harm the father will ultimately be taken out from Gan Eden and brought to Gehenom just to see his son's torment over there meaning the guy is righteous learned Torah did mitzvot did what he did but his son he didn't give him the right chinuch. The kid went off. If it's the father's fault, the father gets punished for it. Severely, he gets hit also, he gets thrown in the game home also. But if it's not the father's fault, but the kid is off, the father still gets punished for it. By how? They take him out of Gan Eden, they put him in Gain Here you go, here's your son. Look at that, what the uh what the satan is doing to him look what the mach- 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 oh, he just chopped his head off you saw that yeah that's your son that's your son oh they're putting him back now let me show you what else they're gonna do oh they're dipping him over here they're dipping him over here oh now he's in chamber number five we're gonna take him to chamber number four the father has to see this and Chafetz Chaim quotes the words of the Gaumi Vilna that we just read and continues to elaborate on it saying who can possibly imagine the father's anguish upon witnessing his son's torment even in this world should one's child whimper from a little prick in his finger the father's heart will be pained severely 
All the more so, how tortured will the father be as he witnesses the destructive angels created by his own son's sins inflict agonizing pain upon his beloved son. How the father will quail from the sight, how cries will burst from his heart as he watches all of this powerlessly to help him. And so the parent must do all he can to prevent his son and himself from su- suffering such fate. Words of the Chafetz Chaim. Now these destructive angels, Abutai, are not destructive angels out of nowhere. These are the destructive angels that the son himself created through his sins. As the Mishnah in Avot says, every time a person makes a mitzvah, he creates an angel. That angel goes up to Shemayim and testifies on the good deeds of the person, and he is the witness because he was created as a result of the good things. On the same token, if a person makes a sin, he creates a demon, creates a bad, a destructive angel. That angel goes up to Shemayim and also testifies, he created me, he is a sinner. And that destructive angel's job will be to forever torment this person until the person does tshuva. And if the person does not do tshuva, that angel will torment him inside Geinom and in Kafakela and everywhere else. It's not leaving. That's why the Chafetz Chaim says a person needs to understand what's on the line here. And that's why when people tell me, listen, Rabbi, you know, your lectures are scarier than uh, other rabbis. I said, okay, good. Well, they helped me. They helped me do tshuva. And, uh, you know, and uh, it really changed my life, they say. You know, and a guy just sent me an email the other day. He said, oh, Baruch Hashem, listen, Rabbi, I was a Bahu yeshiva. I learned yeshiva my whole life. But I had a problem that nobody else knew. What? I was addicted to pornography. And for two years, I was looking for a shiduch and nothing worked. Two years I'm looking for a shiduch, nothing worked. I'm a good guy, come from a good family, good bachur in yeshiva, everything good, but shiduch couldn't find. Then one day I came across your film, your movie, your lectures about tikkun abrit, and realized that my problem is even worse than I thought, and I immediately stopped. And literally within a matter of a couple of months, I not only found my basheret, my 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 uh, my zivug, but we're getting married right now. Mazal tov. You know how many of these stories we have? Baruch Hashem, Mishtabach Shimon Ad. But this kid didn't learn it from where he was supposed to learn it. He didn't learn it from his parents. He didn't learn it in yeshiva. He had to learn it from me. He had to learn from our lectures. Baruch Hashem. It didn't, uh, he's still young. But some people, they can go through an entire life and suffer much more than just a few months of looking for a shiduch. Baruch Hashem, his Torah had enough strength that it gave him merit to find the truth when he was really looking for it. Some people can go through life 30, 40, 50 years old, still not finding the truth because no one wants to give it to them and they're not really looking for it. But here we see that sometimes you have people say, listen, your lectures are helpful. They help me. But they're too scary. Maybe they're not for everybody. And I tell them it's the opposite. The fact that they're scary is what makes them for everybody. What? You mean that somebody that's uh, 10, 11 years old should watch your movie about Tikkun Abrit or the Shior about Genom? Yes. Because if he watches my Shior and my movie and all the lectures that are scaring him to death, he'll do tshuva. He'll do tshuva and he will not want to go to Gehenom. He will do whatever he can to stop doing the actions that will lead him to Gehenom. And if he doesn't watch it, then you are simply putting him in Gehenom. Yeah, but isn't there a nicer way of doing it? Apparently there isn't. Because if there was, somebody else will be doing it. Somebody else will be doing it. The world would not have over 80% of the Jewish people desecrating Shabbat. The world would not have almost a a, a large majority that's even greater than 80% doing things that are immoral, according to the Torah. Wasting seed, pornography, adultery, and so on and so forth. 
This abutai, this type of issue, can only be dealt with with harsh words of truth. That's how people change. And that's why I always tell people, it is better that you listen to my scary voice than hear the voice and the sounds of the wrath that comes from those angels of destruction that Hashem will have to assign to your neshama as a result of not listening to my voice and not listening to the rebuke. So you have to decide which sound you want to hear. You want to hear my sound that perhaps may scare you and the words may scare you but eventually will lead you to do tshuva. Or you want to just hear the hits that are inflicted on your neshama in Ganom and in Kafakela and all those horrible places and even in this world. It's your choice which sound you want to hear. They're both scary. Just one of them doesn't hurt as much as the other. This is one of the most important things that the, we're learning here from the Gaon Mi Vilna, which was a posek. He wasn't a Musar teacher that wrote a bunch of Sifre Musar that, uh, about Gehenna and so on. Surely he talked about it and discussed it in some of his works and so on. But he is known as a Gdolado. He's a posek. But here he's constantly talking about things that most people in today's world would consider scary, musar, fire and brimstone. Some people would even reject it and make it, oh, no, no, it's not really. It's analogies and all types of other fairy tale beliefs. Like the clip that we uh, publicized this morning that this, you know, shows the proof that, unfortunately, the world is full of liars that call themselves rabbis especially if they're coming from Chabad and telling you that there is no Gehenom of fire and brimstone and, and, and hating and so on. That's all fairy tale because their own job, their own uh, a Rebbe, their own Rebbe, the Balatanya, has an enti- several sections in the Tanya that talk about the details of Gehenom, of Kafakela, and so on and so forth. The Gehenom of fire, the Gehenom of snow, the uh, Kafakela, and so on and so forth. And we read from the book, in the Kutem Ha'amarim, in chapter 8. So of course, they're not quoting that, they're quoting their own mind, their own distorted mind. It has nothing to do with Chabad or Hasidut. But they call themselves Chabad, and they represent Chabad, and unfortunately, they are the false Erev Rav of the generation. They're the liars. So, the Gaon Vilna, which as a side note was very, very much against Hasidut for different reasons, he is saying here that the understanding of the punishment that will eventually come to those children that end up becoming wicked adults and those parents of those children that have become wicked, the punishment for those people is horrible horrible according to all measures lest the person does tshuva person has to do tshuva if he doesn't do tshuva in his own actions which include the way he disciplines his kids and she disciplines our kids if they don't do tshuva rabotai they're gonna have a very very big bill a bill they don't want to pay and all of those women that walk around immodestly without a head covering or worse yet with a immodest wig that's longer than the exile thinking that this is the good education that they're offering their kids don't be surprised if your kids end up going against you on a regular basis and they can't stand you and they disrespect you and they view you as a hypocrite even if they don't know why you're a hypocrite these are all messages from heaven But nonetheless, many times you see that parents don't necessarily take this stuff into account. The Avot de Rabbi Natan in chapter 14, Mishnah number 6, or Bareta number 6. There's a uh, story about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, who lost one of his sons. And his Talmidim came to him to try to comfort him. The first five Talmidim, did not succeed. First four Talmidim did not succeed. But Rabbi Elazar ben Arach, 
who the Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said is equal weight against all of the other Chachamim. He said that, listen, Kvod Arav, if a father of a son can be compared to a, uh, a person that was uh, the king entrusted that person some type of jewel for safekeeping. Now, in order to make sure that he's taking care of this jewel, this gift that the king gave him, he pays attention to that gift at all times. And he takes pride in his how much attention he pays to that jewel, and he makes sure it's always clean and it's always protected. But before you know it, he realizes that this is not only a big responsibility, it's a burden. It's a burden that's not an easy one because he knows that if he loses it or it gets broken or something, that's a problem with the king. So one day when the king says, listen, thank you for protecting my jewel, but I want it back. The man is happy to give it back. Why? He gave him the, the jewel the same way that he got it, pure. You, my dear Rabbi, you got a son that's a jewel and you protected that jewel by teaching him Torah, Mitzvot, and Gmilut Chasadim and you returned that precious Neshama that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you just as pure as he gave it to you. You should be happy. And Ravot de Rabbi Natan says that this was what consoled Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Because he knew this is 100% emet. Now of course if somebody does not learn Torah and does not toil over Torah, you tell them such a thing, they're going to think that you're insensitive and a lot of other things. But nonetheless, when somebody understands what the purpose of this world is, that it's not this world, we're not living in this world for the sake of this world. We're living in this world in order to earn our position in the eternal world. And when a person understands that, and he understands that part of that mission involves raising your kids to be righteous kids and so on, then you know that as long as you did your job, you did the best you possibly could, and your kids ended up becoming good kids, tzaddikim, learning Torah, doing mitzvot, perhaps even chachamim, scholars and so on, you protected that jewel that Hashem gave you for safekeeping. It doesn't matter whose birthday you're celebrating and who, who goes where and who goes what. As long as everybody is doing the will of Hashem, you did your job in the world. You did your job in the world. Which makes the agony of losing people earlier in life or, or unexpectedly and so on a little easier to deal with. It's never easy, obviously. In law alinu v'lo alechem, not on us and not on you. But nonetheless, we all know that tragedies sometimes happen, as it happened here in Florida, in the uh, in uh, this uh, sunrise community, Shem Achem, our entire building collapsed and so on. I'm sure there were some very de- decent people there. Now, if some of these people were scholars, the you know children of scholars. I could assure you it's much easier for those parents to deal with the anguish than it is for a secular parent. Because that religious parent that toiled over Torah understands that this world is simply a corridor to the real world. This body is simply clothing on the the real person, which is the neshama. It's just clothing. And all that happens is after a person dies is they change clothing. That neshama goes somewhere else, goes to Shemaim if he's righteous, goes to Gan Eden, and eventually to Olam Abba. Really, the, uh, the only thing that happened that's negative is the fact that you won't be able to see them until you get there yourself. That's it. No, no reason to overmourn for years and years like unfortunately some people do in a secular world where they literally, they lose somebody that's important to them and they end up losing themselves. They end up crying for the rest of their life. So of course, that's not the right thing to do. Hashem left you in the world so you can live in this world, not so you could uh, mourn for the rest of your days. But nonetheless, it's not easy. Without Torah, it's impossible. And then the uh, Gaumi Vilna continues in this letter saying, and even if one, Vaf im tamid bemusar 
אוי לאותה בושה והצער והביזיון בעולם הבא את אביה היא מחללת כמן קריין לרשע בן צדיק רשע בן רשע וכולי And even if one guides them, the children, constantly in Musab, but the, but the children don't accept it. Woe to one's sorrow and shame in the world to come. As it is written in uh, Vaikra, uh, the book of uh, Numbers, chapter 21, verse 9, she defiles her father, and in such a case, the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 52a, says, in such a case where you see that the uh, uh, the uh, the son of a righteous man is a wicked person, you can actually call that wicked person wicked son of wicked. Meaning that generally speaking, if a person is righteous, they're righteous. If they're wicked, they're wicked, right? Now, if he's wicked and his father is wicked, you can call him Rasha ben Rasha, wicked person, son of wicked. If he's righteous and his father's righteous, Sadiq ben Sadiq. But if he is wicked and his father is righteous, generally speaking, you're even allowed to call that there is father wicked now. If he didn't give him the right chinuch. If the father did not give him the right chinuch, then you say, Rasha ben Rasha, wicked son of wicked. But of course, if the father did everything possible, and toiled and, and prayed and did everything like a uh, Chizkiyahu did before Menashe came into the world who be started his life as a very wicked person but eventually did Shuba. but Chizkiyahu was a Malach Hashem was an angel of Hashem was a Tzaddik so you couldn't say that uh, Menashe is wicked son of wicked and, and in essence call Chizkiyahu wicked Menashe was wicked and his father was righteous but on a general scope if a kid is wicked, most of the time it's because the parents didn't try hard enough. Most of the time it's because the parents did not try hard enough. What is trying hard enough? What's trying hard enough, Rabotai? The Mishnah Bura, section 47 in Al-Khan uh, 10, says that parents should always have tfilot, prayers, davening for their children on their tongues. Davening that they are, they will become lumde Torah, meaning people that study Torah. Daven that they, your kids will become tzaddikim. Daven that your kids will be baale midot tovot. They will have good character traits. Don't daven that your kid's going to be a doctor. Don't daven that your kid will be a millionaire. Don't daven that your kid will be uh, financially settled in uh, a special town in, up, in upstate New York and have a vacation house in Beverly Hills. Don't dive in for stuff like I said. Do not waste your time. Do not waste your precious prayers on such things. Pray that your kids will be lomde Torah. They will study Torah. Whether they become also working in a business world or not is not necessarily as, as critical. Some people do, some people don't. But most important thing is that they learn Torah every day of their life. No vacations. Even on Tisha B'Av, there's Torah to learn. Even on a day of... Uh, of uh, of uh, mourning, there's Torah to learn. Torah of, uh, uh, of, of Avelut, of mourning. Davin that your kids will be tzaddikim, righteous people, good people. Davin that your kids will be people that have midot tovot, good character traits. That's what the Chafetz Chaim writes in the Mishnah Bura. As a side note, in the issue in the area of Kedusha, between man and wife there is a lot of intricate details that we discussed in our lecture years ago called kosher intimacy of different alachot of the rambam of how uh, it's the right way to be intimate with your wife in a holy way although there are certain things that are, are allowed doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do them although there's certain things that uh uh, people do doesn't necessarily mean that you need to join the club there are certain things to do there are certain things not to do everybody needs to know where they stand in life now generally speaking we advise the average people to do everything just make sure as the Rambam writes just make sure not to waste seed 
do what you want to do with your wife as long as she's pure she went to the mikveh and so on you could do what you want just make sure not to waste seed and make sure obviously that she's teora she's not nida all of you young people that are unmarried and you still have boyfriend girlfriend that you're acting as if you're married you should know that you're going to go to Gainom unless you do tshuva immediately and even if you end up marrying that person you're going to end up going to Gainom with that person unless you do tshuva intimacy is forbidden before marriage and needless to say intimacy is forbidden if the woman did not go to the mikveh and if she's not married she's not allowed to go to the mikveh so that means that all of you guys that have girlfriends and all of you girls that have boyfriends and you're intimate you're going to gain and probably kafakela also unless you do tshuva and you stop right away right away no joking this is to scare you but it's also 100 percent to warn you from the inevitable and many times those people that are intimate before marriage end up breaking up anyway sometimes as a divorce sometimes before the marriage sometimes during the actual sheva brachot even it's a disaster why because they started their life in a cursed way now the intimacy in Judaism is a beautiful thing it's considered unlike in the idolatrous world of Christianity intimacy is considered a holy event in Judaism it's a very holy thing one of the ways that we as a Jewish people make ourselves holy is through the way that we are we express our intimacy to the way we preserve ourselves and so on and so forth to be with your wife is 100 percent a mitzvah when she's allowed to you it's a mitzvah from the Torah even if there's no kids possible it's a hundred percent a mitzvah and it's a very holy thing now sometimes a person will have the merit that Hashem will give him kids now if that person has a little bit of Torah mind they're gonna think before the kid comes what kind of kid do they want because they know that Akadosh Baruch Hu lacks nothing meaning that Hashem's hand is not short for anything it can give you anything so you could ask Hashem for anything you can ask Hashem not only for money and not only for Zivug but you can even ask him for a specific baby now one of the critical times to think about this is before intimacy before intimacy with your wife before intimacy with your husband it's a very good idea to pray it's even good idea to study a little bit before intimacy but so much so that if a person wants a truly holy neshama to come to this world they will sanctify themselves through their actions not just during that last day last minute but everyday actions they will sanctify themselves to such an extent that they will be able to understand the message that I'm about to give you if they have not sanctified themselves what I'm about to tell you will sound disgusting in their mind perverted or 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 demented or, or something wrong if you don't understand the message but you're neutral about it you're you're not in a bad shape you're in pretty good shape if you think perverted thoughts about what I just what I'm about to tell you you're in you know should be getting a spiritual ambulance should be getting a spiritual ambulance keep listening to the shuli and perhaps that will be the ambulance but if you do understand it you're in good shape what I'm about to say the Ora Chaim HaKadosh Ora Chaim HaKadosh only a few people I believe four tzaddikim in history were called HaKadosh Ora Chaim HaKadosh writes that if a man wants a holy child a holy child right before he releases his seed yes there's action his pleasure and so on but he still has his mind on a kadosh baruchu and right before he releases his seed he should think about what midot what character traits he wants this child to have that's what he should think before the seed comes out because according to the Chaim, once the seed is out that's it the kedusha that's supposed to be in it is gone now of course it doesn't necessarily mean that every time seed comes out of the person's body it's gonna end up in a child but that means that he still has to do it every single time so he has to be focused not just during the act he already has to be focused 
before. He already has to live a life of focus on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, And he has to think about it at a, at a moment that usually most people have no control over themselves. Unfortunately, most people are like animals. They're like, just a, uh, let me just a, uh, have this uh, ecstasy that's like their purpose of life, unfortunately, like animals. They don't care who, what, when, and how. Now, of course, this should not be expressed verbally out loud. You shouldn't talk about it with your wife and ruin the, uh, the, the ambiance and the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, aspect of lust even that's in there because if it wasn't for lust, people wouldn't bring kids to the world. Even the Gemara says this. So don't talk about this with your wife in the moment and so on. This is all in your mind. But a person should aim to have his mind purified to the point where although he is having a good time, his wife is having a good time, everything is great for all intents and purposes, everything is normal. But his mind is focused on a Boreid Barach and a Kadosh Baruch Hu to the point where he is asking a Kadosh Baruch Hu right before the seed comes out, which is the most climatic moment of the entire event. He's asking a Kadosh Baruch Hu to give him a child with a specific midot, specific character trait. My recommendation, ask for humility. If you get humility, you get everything. A humble person can get every, you know, can get the best qualities in every aspect. Because if you say, oh yeah, I want him to be smart, okay, you can be smart, but a criminal. But you're not going to have a humble criminal. So, the best, in my opinion, and then according to the Torah, even is, is humility. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, Anav Mikol Adam, the humblest man of all time, who also had the wisdom more than everybody else, and Kedusha, and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that if you got the message, but you have no idea how you're going to get there, that's okay. That makes you normal. That makes you a normal person. If you're already there, Ashrecha ve'ashrech elkecha. Praiseworthy are you, and praiseworthy is your share. If you're mocking what I'm about, what I just said, you are in a spiritual disastrous shape, to say the least. You should go and get yourself a spiritual ambulance. Perhaps this is the lecture that will be it. If this lecture is not enough for you, I suggest going to my Gehenom lecture number 84 in the Perkei Avot series. Perhaps that will get you out of that spiritual disaster that you're in because you're still thinking filth during times of Torah. Not such a good idea. Anyway, Rabotai, this is Torah and I have to learn it. Even the issues of intimacy and how and who and what and where. But again, remember, don't become a Torah scholar during a time where you're supposed to be your, the husband. Same thing with women. Don't uh, start uh, giving your, uh, your husband Musar during that time either. These are all things you have in your mind. But the key is that the prayers have to start even before the kids come to the world. Needless to say, you have to pray for your kids while they're in the world, constantly. At every opportunity you have, pray and pray and pray for your kids to be righteous, to learn Torah, to love Torah, to love mitzvot, and so on and so forth. Pray for them nonstop. A couple came to the Stipe Lagoon with a one-year-old child asking for a blessing. The stipler told them that they're late. And they said, no, no, Kvodarav, the baby's only one years old. And the Stipe Lagoon says, yes, exactly, you're late. You were supposed to pray even before the child came to the world. Ask for a blessing even before the child came to the world. Surely it's still okay to get a blessing even if the child is 30, not one. Any age, it's good to get a blessing. But to really get a blessing that the kid is going to be righteous, ask for something even before, do tshuva even before, work on yourself even before. Be smart by preparing ahead of time with the blessings, with tshuva, with everything. Now, there's a extraordinary story where in uh, Tana Deve Liao, in chapter 18, it says that there was a certain God-fearing Jew who was a Kohen and had 10 children. 
six sons and four daughters. And every single day, this tzaddik would daven for his kids, pleading, begging, and crying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for mercy, so that not a single one of them would ever go off the derech and turn to sins of an immorality. And Chachamim say that when Ezra Sofer brought Klal Israel back to Eretz Israel, among them was this Kohen, who before he passed on, saw his sons and his grandsons fill the positions of Kohen Gadol and the assistants for 50 years. Meaning this Kohen cried to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so his sons are tzaddikim, righteous, decent people. He didn't ask for them to become, you know, the Kohen Gadol, the Gadol Adol, but just to be tzaddikim, righteous with Hashem. Don't turn to immoral sins. You prayed for that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'll even give you more. I'll even give you more. Same thing it says in Gemara Masichet Yoma. It says about a special tzaddikah named Kimchit. Kimchit had seven sons, all of which became Kohen Gadol at some point during their life. When the Chachamim asked, how, how is it that you merited to have all seven of your sons be such tzaddikim that they're Kohen Gadol? How? She said, because my whole life the walls of my house never saw my hair. The walls of my house never saw my hair. And the Yerushalmi says, the walls of our house never even saw the skin of our body. Meaning that when she changed her clothes or when she changed her kisuyosh, always there was covering, there was always modesty. Always modesty. This is why also, Rabotai, a woman, if you're going to change clothes, Always change in the shower. Never change in a bedroom and, and, and walk around without clothes on and things like that. Never ever do such a thing. Always change your clothes inside the bathroom. There are both a lot of reasons for it and there's also mystical issues, Kabbalistic issues, all types of demons and dibukim and so on that are constantly looking for women when they're at that time. So it's very, very... Uh, immodest to walk around immodest even if you're alone in your house but needless to say if you express higher than than, than uh, the obligation of modesty meaning you're even more modest than you have to be you're changing but you're changing even when you're changing it's in privacy that type of modesty will be a source of education that your kids will benefit from, even if they never see such a thing. But your daughters will learn from you. And even your sons will know what to look for in a wife when they understand how righteous their mother is, that they never even see their mother's hair, they never see their mother's skin, and so on and so forth. The Shem of some of these mothers that walk around half naked next to their own sons, living a delusional life thinking that their sons are not thinking about them just because they're their, their mothers it's unfortunately a, uh, a a taboo topic but nonetheless it does happen it does happen this is one of the things that the satan destroys people's lives with and it all starts with lack of modesty unintentional even lack of modesty so this particular verse that the Gaomi Vilna uses that she defiles her father because she's uh you know it says that if uh if you guide them and they still don't listen it's written about such people the verse in the Torah it says she defiles her father that particular verse is written about the daughter of a Kohen the daughter of a Kohen at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu the time of the Bet Mikdash, that went to the uh, route of immorality, even while she was in the house of her father, meaning unmarried woman. Now, unfortunately, Rabotai, the uh, Torah says that a Kohen, that his daughter is immoral, that she is promiscuous before marriage. And by promiscuous, it doesn't mean she has to have 50 boyfriends. Promiscuous is even if she has one boyfriend. Before marriage, she's considered a zona, according to the Torah. 
And if he is a Kohen, the Gemara says that you no longer need to respect him. There's a special privilege of being a Kohen. And the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, and also the Paskin uh, Ta the Ramah in Shuchan Aruch, Or uh, Section 128, Alacha number uh, 41, and also the Magen of Ram rules the same way, says that a Kohen that has a daughter that is uh, immoral, no honor needs to be reserved for that Kohen, such as serving the Kohen first, and all types of special honor that's given to the Kohen. Now, what happens sometimes is that certain people do not understand what it means to be a Kohen. A Kohen is, in essence, a unique species among the Jewish people. So much so that the uh, the book by Rav Zamir Cohen, Shichye, it's called the, the Coming Revolution, or in uh, there's another uh, name for it, Science Comes of Age, uh, and we give it in our uh, Kiruv package that's uh, on our website. Baruch Hashem, we've sent out hundreds and hundreds of copies of this book in the Kiruv package over the years. One of the sections in this book shows that they did a research. They did a research on a very large group of Kohanim, very large group of Kohanim, and they found out that the Kohen, someone that's really a Kohen, has a unique DNA, something that no other man of any other religion, or even among the Jewish people, no other human being has a unique part of their DNA. So the Kohen has something special. Surely, they also have a special role in the world. But if a person does not understand the role of a Kohen, the uniqueness of a Kohen, the obligation of a Kohen, they could treat themselves or the Kohen as if they're just anybody else, there's nothing special about them, and unfortunately cause a lot of disaster, and bring themselves or other people a cursed life. Now, a Kohen, Rabotai, is not allowed to just marry anybody. Needless to say, Jews are not allowed to marry just anybody. If you are a scholar, you need to marry a woman that's coming from a good family. You can't just marry any zona that's pretty. You have to marry into a good family. If you are the daughter of a Kohen, you have to marry a Ben Torah, someone that's coming from a, not only a religious family, but someone that's coming from a family of Torah. These are things that are very necessary. And a woman uh, doesn't, a uh, family that doesn't uh, you know, observe these things, unfortunately has many problems. Now, of course, the Kohen is someone that can't marry non-Jews, just like all, non- all Jews cannot marry non-Jews. But even more so, a Kohen cannot marry even certain Jews. A Kohen cannot marry a widow. A Kohen cannot marry a divorcee, even if it's his own divorce. Even if it's own wife, that but he divorced her, he can't remarry her. A Kohen cannot marry a convert, even though for some reason the Yetzirah tries to convince a lot of converts that the only thing they want is a Kohen. I don't know. It's like uh, Shlomo Amedach says, Maim gnuvim im taku. Stolen water are, are, are sweeter. Obviously, all water tastes the same. But if it's stolen, he says, oh, maybe it's sweeter. That's people always want what they can't have. It's strange, but... Many converts feel offended that they can't marry a Kohen. It's very, very strange, Yetzirah. But nonetheless, Kohanim cannot marry certain people. But one of the things also is that a Kohen cannot marry a woman even if she came from a Torah scholar's house, even if she came from the best house in the world. But she was intimate with a non-Jew. Even one time. A Kohen is not allowed to marry her under any condition. Now, unfortunately, this issue has come across my desk several times. And I've told you a story about this perhaps a year or two ago where I had a student of mine where she met a Kohen. She met a Kohen and she wanted to marry him. And she asked me about it and I told her, I'm sorry, but you can't marry this Kohen. And she said, why not? He's a nice guy. He likes me. I I like him. He's Jewish. I'm Jewish. What's wrong with him? And I had to break her the news that because she was intimate with a non-Jew at some point during her life, before she did tshuva, she's not allowed to be with this Kohen. 
of course this broke her heart broke his heart broke a lot of hearts but nonetheless that's the alacha now unfortunately sometimes people don't want to listen they don't want to listen so they look for who they look for the Erev Rav. They don't want to look for Rav. They look for Erev Rav. What's Erev Rav? Rabbis, they will tell them whatever they want without knowing what the real Allah is. And they're going to go find somebody. And unfortunately, a story came across my desk where someone said, listen, I spoke to three different rabbis. I don't know if all three rabbis are connected in the same chamber of Gehenom, but nonetheless, all three rabbis gave the same answer, apparently. And all three rabbis said that yes although she was with a non-jew not the same person a completely different person this girl was with a non-jew for 10 years not just once but this is even once she was not shomer torah mitzvot she was not observant she's considered like a captured baby a tinok shenishba so therefore it's this alacha doesn't apply to us she's allowed to marry a kohen that's what she heard from three different rabbis. We double checked with Poskim, with Shuchan Aruch, with Rabbanim, very quickly. Rabotai, the answer was so conclusive that it's embarrassing, embarrassing that people dare call themselves rabbis and still say these foolish things. But the clarity on this issue the clarity on this issue is so extraordinary that the Gemara in Masechet Ketubot page 13b and also the Shulchan Aruch and Evan Ezer in uh, Siman 6 Seif 8 and 9 all say that a woman that was a Jewish woman that was with a non-Jew even one time even one time is forbidden to marry a Kohen ever. So much so that even if she was raped, Hashem Yishmo Vietzid, even if she was raped, meaning she wasn't with the Kohen on purpose, she was raped by a filthy, disgusting, disgrace of a human being that happened to be non Jewish. She was raped. Even that, she's still forbidden by the Torah. According to Shulchan Aruch, according to Poskim, according to the Gemara, according to all opinions, she's forbidden from marrying a, a, a Kohen, even if she was raped. Needless to say, if she did it on purpose. So, that's the actual Allah. It has nothing to do with modern, not modern, really religious, less religious. This is Torah. When a person observes the Torah, they listen to the Torah. But unfortunately, what happens is sometimes a person is like they got miseducation from their parents, who told them, listen, you have to make your way in life. Even if that means finagling a few things, cheating a few things, turning a blind eye to a few things. And they teach the kid to lie. They teach the kid to cheat when necessary. Even though the Torah says, Midval Sheker Tichak, from a thing of lies, stay away from. They say, maybe that Allah is for Moshe Rabbeinu, not for us in today's age. In essence, the kid grows up into a liar. But not a liar that's compulsive every day and every day, but whenever is necessary, on an as-needed basis. And unfortunately, they feel like lying to the rabbis is an as-needed basis. So what ends up happening is that sometimes they don't tell the rabbis the full story and they simply say, listen, I heard that I'm not allowed, but the rabbi doesn't know, so he can just marry me anyway with this coin that I'm not allowed to be with. And what they end up getting is a life full of curses, a life full of curses, not just in this world, but in Olam Abba. So much so, the Parashat Nitzavim says, such a person is going against the Torah, all of the tzaddikim of Am Yisrael and Shamayim, all of the tzaddikim, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Meir Baal Anes, Rav Ovadia, Or Chaim, the Stipe Lagaon, all the tzaddikim, the Gaon Mivilna, 
the, the Arizal, all the Tzadikim that we've mentioned and that we didn't mention, all the ones that we know about and we don't know about, all of the Tzadikim that ever lived, all say, Arul, this person is Arul, the husband is Arul, the wife is Arul, forever, and everybody says, Amen. And so are the rabbis that told that person that they could marry. Which in essence enabled that person to do it. That's how bad it is. So when you see people simply hearing the truth, but ignoring it, going against it, looking for maybe a backdoor way to get what they want anyway. Unfortunately, Rabotai, it's a very sad, very sad situation because there is no tikkun for such a problem. There is no tikkun. They can never stay married. Like meaning that their tikkun would be to get divorced. That would be their tikkun. They cannot stay married. So that means if they have kids, all the kids are problematic. It's such a horrible thing and people don't understand it. They don't understand it. And those rabbis that misinformed those people, whether they did it out of ignorance or they did it out of just pure wickedness, doesn't really make much of a difference. The outcome is still the outcome. And it's critical for a person to know that when a Kadosh Baruch Hu said something in the Torah, whether you accepted it in your life or not, whether you were educated with it during your childhood or not, doesn't really make much of a difference. You're obligated by it nonetheless, because your neshama was at Mount Sinai and said, Na we will do and we will fulfill, and we're here. That's what your neshama, your neshama already accepted it before you came into the world. And that difficulty that you have is simply a Kadosh Baruch Hu taking the mic and saying, testing, testing, he's tapping on your head. Testing, testing, one, two, three, difficulty that touches your heart. Do you love me? Difficulty, you found a shiduch that you're not allowed to be in. Banging on your head, banging on your heart. Do you love me or not, a Kadosh Baruch Hu is saying. If you love me, you're going to listen to the halakha. And you're going to run away as far as possible from this man. And you're going to run as far as possible from this girl. You don't love me. You're going to do whatever you want. And the Kadosh Baruch says, I'm going to have to do whatever I need to. Not what I want. What I need to do. Why? Because my Torah is a myth. My Torah is a myth. The Gaumi Vilna says that sometimes people don't want to listen and sometimes those people are your kids so to have kids that listen to parents is a very very big thing it's a very big privilege to have kids that listen to parents very big deal to have kids listen to their parents the admor mitzans one time met the khatam sofer and when he saw one of the Khatam Sofer's children, the Ktav Sofer, he was only 20 years old, and he had a conversation with him. And he was so impressed with how dedicated he was to Torah, how much Yirat Shamayim exuded from him. It's unbelievable, a young man. And he asked the Khatam Sofer, Kvod Arav, please, tell me, how did you merit to have such a son? How could we merit to have such a son? The Khatam Sofer, got very emotional he took off his hat and said you see this hat how to merit such a boy you see this hat I filled this hat with tears of prayer a number of times for this son to be the way he is not just before he came to the world and not just when he was a toddler but every single day I cry over this boy to be the way he is every day a woman's obligation in her life is to cry over her kids a man should cry over his kids surely the mom is 
capable of doing it more often than the father at times but nonetheless you need to cry over your kids on a regular basis pray pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu over your kids and one of the things that motivates people is fear fear sometimes is the motivated to cry fear is the motivated to change and that's what the Otsara Midrashim brings here the Otsara Midrashim Masechet Chibuta Kevel chapter 5 describes that a person's judgment at the time of death when Hashem tells a person do you know how much I have troubled myself for you I saw to it that you will survive in your mother's womb and after your birth I sustained you and protected you from torment did you involve yourself in Torah and Chesed if the Neshama of the deceased did fulfill this mandate of Torah and Chesed his judgment is discharged immediately but if he did not HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself then hands over this Neshama to five destructive angels one of those angels the fifth one will bring his father and mother of that Neshama And then ask the neshama to beat his parents because they did not educate the kid with the life of Torah and good deeds. And the boy will say to them, or the man at that point, a woman will say to the parents while hitting them, why did you not educate me with Torah and mitzvot? Look where I'm going to go now to gain home. And if that neshama is not capable of hitting their parents, then the angels force the parents to hit the, the son, the child, and they hit them anyway. Meaning the, the damage, the damage here, the, the pain and agony in the real world has no mercy like people think it does. Mercy is only reserved for this world. There's no mercy over there, Rabbi And when a person does not take the rules of the Torah as seriously as Akadosh Baruch Hu does, unfortunately, they're reserving their life of eternity to a place that they will never even want their enemies to go to. Now, the Gaon said that sometimes people don't want to listen. People simply don't want to listen. And he says to his wife, similarly, you should take care that to guide the, your daughters in other matters such as Lashonara, gossip. They should not eat and drink without uttering a before and after blessing. And the Birkat Amazon and Kriyat Shema should have proper kavana and intent. But what if they don't listen? What if they don't listen? Sometimes people ask me, and they say, listen, Rabbi, I have a friend, a family member, a spouse, that I want them to do tshuva, and they won't listen to me. I tell them, and they don't listen. How do you get people to listen? The Gemara says that anyone that has Yirat Shamaim, Dvarav Nishmaim, his words are heard, her words are heard. Which means that if you're speaking to people and they're not listening to you, that means you need to first and foremost list, you know, work on yourself, on your own Yirat Shamaim. But I, on a more practical perspective for people to understand, because sometimes you don't really know if you're delusional and you have in your mind Yirat Shamaim, but in reality it doesn't exist. So this is an easier thing to judge. Don't ask yourself, If you're going to speak to somebody and try to rebuke them, whether that's your kids, your spouse, your parents, your friends, some stranger, whoever it is, before you speak to them, many times people want to practice what they're going to say. They want to prepare what they're going to say. They want to 
prepare how they're going to say it. Don't worry so much about that. Sure, you should have yourself prepared and know what you're going to say before you say it. That's that's good. A, uh, that's a good practice to have in life in general. But that should not be your priority. Why? Because if your words are truly coming from the heart, in order to help people, then you will get the siyat dishmaya that your words will reach their heart regardless of how you say them. Now, it's not really how you speak, if you're a good speaker or you're not a good speaker. It's not even what you speak about. So much as, why are you speaking to them? Meaning, instead of worrying so much about how you're going to approach them and what you're going to say, you should ask yourself, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to talk to this person? Is it to show them that I know more than them? Is it to show them that they're mistaken and therefore they're going to change and therefore I'll get a reward for it? Why do I want to tell this person all these things? Because I want to scare them? Because I want to shock them? Because I want to enlighten them? Why? What's your motivation behind it? If your motivation is pure, where you want to help them for their sake and their sake alone, your words will come from the heart and will reach their heart. But if there's even an inkling of you being inspired by ego, being inspired by some type of financial or physical benefit, it's not going to be 100% from your heart. And the more it's not from your heart, the less effective it's going to be. Less heart, less effect. But not heart, oh no, no, I really care about them. No, no, no. It's not caring about them. Caring about a kadosh baruchu. Caring about their relationship with a kadosh baruchu. Caring about a child of Akadosh Baruch Hu, even if it wasn't that person that you happen to be related to, meaning it could be anybody, anybody that's a child of Akadosh Baruch Hu, and you would do the same thing. If you would do that, your words will reach the hearts of every person. But if you have a bias and you're trying to do it because you want to get honor, you're trying to do it because you want people to say Chazaku Baruch. You're trying to do it just to see if it works. You're trying to do it because you're trying to make money. You're trying to do it for all types of other reasons. It won't work as much. In fact, it may not work at all. That's why sometimes you'll see certain people, they've been speaking to people for 10, 20 years. How many Baalet Shuvah did you get? I don't know, maybe 10, 20. Oh, so like one, two a year. Yeah, isn't that great? Say to say, well, if you get one a whole life, you already got yourself, yeah, yeah, all that stuff is great, but 20 years you got 20 people. You really don't care about them, do you? What do you mean? I, I, my whole life, 20 years I dedicated to help people. Yeah, but you know you could, you could have done a lot more if you cared about them more than about how much money you're going to get to help them. More than how much you care about the building. More than how much you care about your family. More than how much you care about your life. More than how much you care about everything else. If you cared about a Kadosh Baruch Hu 100%, your words would work. Your words would work. This is one of the things that each and every one of us can do. We could all ask ourselves, why do I want to help other people do tshuva? If your answer is genuine and really something that's pure a kadosh, a kadosh Baruch Hu will make everything work a kadosh Baruch Hu will make everything work because after all he wants his kids to do tshuva 
He's just looking for people to want the same thing as him. And if you want to be a vessel that Hashem uses to help people do tshuva, Hashem will make you a vessel. Even if you don't know how to speak the language, even if you don't have necessarily all the tools, we'll make it work. It'll make it work. That includes also your kids. That includes your kids. If you tell your kids that you care about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, sometimes that's not going to affect them. But if you show them that you care about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that will affect them. How can you show them that you care about HaKadosh Baruch Hu? You learn Torah in your house. You learn Torah in your house regularly. Even if you learn in a kolel, you also learn at home. And not only learn, you practice. And not only practice, you teach. And not only teach, you work with them, you play with them, you show how the Torah is beautiful. The Torah is beautiful. Make the Torah beautiful in your house. Make the mitzvot extraordinary. The Gaumi Vilna is mentioning the mitzvot of blessings. Arabi again, Allah Shalom used to say that many parents teach, teach their little kids when they get something, they get a candy, they get a cake, they get something. Tagit toda, say thank you. Arabi again says, don't teach them, say thank you. Teach them, say a blessing, say a bracha. What thank you? Thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that you got this food. Say a blessing. If you say a blessing with Kavana, your kid will want to say a blessing with Kavana. I had one person say that their kid, three, four-year-old kid, says to them, I don't like the long Birkat Amazon. I want the short one. You know, he's talking about the... Uh, the one that you do for Mezonot. I don't like the long one. So the father says, but I love the long one. I love the long one. So the little kid is curious. Why would anybody want the bigger one? Why would anybody want the longer blessing? So he asks his father, like, why? The father says, do you know that the longer one, I get to ask Hashem for more stuff. I can ask him for more good things, more good health, more toys, more Torah, more mitzvot, more, 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 it's more stuff. And also, you see how we ate all this stuff? When I give him a longer blessing, it's a, I say, give me even more, meaning the next time he'll give me even more stuff. And don't you want more stuff? And every kid's gonna say, yeah, I want more stuff, I want more toys, I want more, I want more, 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 every, that's like the mantra of every kid in the world, more. So if you want more, we have to say more thank you to Hashem. So what does the kid say? Yeah, yeah, I love the long one. Literally, 30 seconds, the kid did tshuva, three years old, four years old. Why? Because the Abba loved the long one. Love the long Birkat Amazon. If the Abba didn't really like the long one, do you think the kid would have learned? Absolutely not. Why? Because the father, if he didn't really love the long one, he didn't love the long Birkat Amazon, he wouldn't have had the Siyat Rishmaya to say such a thing. You see, sometimes people, they have a confusion where they do a blessing so they can eat. That's confused. That's spiritually confused. Meaning that the blessing is treated as a barrier to food. They do a blessing so they can eat. If someone wants to be righteous, if someone wants to have their kids as righteous, without even rebuking them, without ever lifting a finger, they have to start training themselves to eat in order to make a blessing. Meaning that the blessing is the priority of the meal, not the food. Meaning that, that it's an entire mentality change. Yeah, I eat, but it's because I want to do Birkat Amazon. Like, I'm going to eat bread, not because I particularly love bread more than everything else, but if I don't eat bread, I can't do the long Birkat Amazon. I can only do the short one on Mezonot and a cookie. 
Ah, I want more. I want to talk to Hashem even more, especially since Birkat Hamazon is the number one most important blessing in the entire Torah in all of Judaism. More important than Shema Yisrael, more important than Amidah. So I want the Birkat Hamazon at least once a day, if not more. It's the number one blessing. Maram Aseret Bachot says, who wrote the Birkat Hamazon? First part of Birkat Hamazon was written by Moshe Rabbeinu. A part of the Birkat Hamazon was written by Moshe Rabbeinu. Then you have Yeshua Benu. Then you have Anshay Knesset Akdola. Then you have David Amelech and Shlomo. You have giants wrote Birkat Hamazon. Giants. I want to be like them. And if I can't be like them, I want to emulate them. I want to do whatever they did. So I eat because I want to bless. I'm going to eat bread. Dafka because I want to do Birkat Hamazon. Not, I'm not going to eat bread because I don't feel like doing Birkat Hamazon. If you start living your life that way, your kids will learn from your actions that, and see your expression of love to Hashem through your actions. The Ben Ishchai says that when someone does Birkat Hamazon, when someone does Birkat Hamazon, immediately an angel from Shemaim comes and sits right next to him or her. And waits to see if they are reading from the Sidul and paying attention to the Birkat Amazon. Mitzvah de Oraita. It's a biblical mitzvah. It's not a rabbinical mitzvah, not that it's any less necessarily, but it's a biblical mitzvah to do Birkat Amazon after you bread. And a Kadosh Baruch who sends an angel to sit right next to you when you're doing Birkat Amazon, and that angel's paying attention to you to see whether you are paying attention to the Birkat Amazon or you're thinking about, oh, I can't wait to finish. Oh, I got to go to an appointment. Oh, this is taking so long. Ah, this, ah, that. You start a Birkat Amazon, you finish at Yom Kippur or something. The angel is paying attention to the person to see if they have Kavanah on this prayer. It doesn't say this about anything else. It says it on Birkat Amazon. And the Ben Yishchai says, in Ilchot Birkat Amazon, that angel is staring at the person to see if they pay attention. The moment they look away, showing that they're not really paying attention, they don't really have kavana with the Birkat Amazon, that angel immediately goes up to Shemaim and complains about the person to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If a person understood the meaning of such a thing, they're going to be like that three, four-year-old kid and say, I love the long one. I love the long one. Why I love the long one? First and foremost, Akadosh Baruch Hu cares about it so much that he makes it a biblical mitzvah. Second of all, he shows how much he cares about our kavana by sending us an angel. Third and foremost, we have extraordinary amount of blessings in it. To ask a Kadosh Baruch Hu for everything that's possible that we could ever want. Everything possible. Last but not least, it's a great way to show not only a Kadosh Baruch Hu how much we love him and his blessings and his Torah and his mitzvot, but we can show that to our kids more than anything else. You can't really show a Kadosh, your kids how much you love Hashem by the way you say Shema Yisrael. You can't really show your kids how much you love Hashem by, uh, you know, what you do at work. It's not always easy to do all those things. But when you cut the Mazon, if you tell your kid, no, I dafka want, I on purpose want to eat bread because I want to do Birkat the Mazon. And when you do Birkat the Mazon, you do it in a beautiful way, in a nice tune, out loud. Get the family involved when you're doing the Rachaman so they can say Amen. Get everybody involved and you'll see this becomes one of the greatest teachers, greatest teaching tools you have in your household. And also greatest sources of bracha. You see, Rabotai Karim, the Birkat Amazon is a big deal. 
but so is chinuch and you can use both together one of the tzaddikim named rabbi moshe Ivier saw that his city was having many tragedies and told this city told the people of his community that surely all of these fires and tragedies are a divine message that a kadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do tshuva for something now obviously the people the community were religious people and he says to them how do you make religious people do tshuva from now on if each and every single one of you takes on birkat amazon of course you're already doing it but birkat amazon with kavana where you're going to be looking at the sidur when you're doing birkat amazon because when you look at the text it helps the kavana if you each take on that every time you do birkat amazon you're going to read it from a sidur i promise you fire will not touch you again you're not gonna you're gonna get protected from heaven the entire community was baffled at how the rav he was a ish kadosh but they're still baffled how he can make such a promise but they listened to him and almost everybody took it on themselves except one person and suddenly the fires stopped coming the tragedy stopped for a long period of time after some years Arab Ivier left this world and immediately after a fire broke out the worst fire that the city ever saw but miraculously not a single Jewish house was affected one house of the one person that was skeptical of Rabbi Viel. only one person was skeptical didn't take it on saw that the fire was coming closer and closer to the house and this person was married to a tzaddikah and this tzaddikah said right now go to Rav Moshe Yviel's kever his gravesite and ask for mercy ask for an apology say I'm sorry Kvod Rav, I didn't listen to you I didn't have emunat chachamim and take on yourself to do what the rest of the community did this person ran went to the gravesite asked for a mechila from the holy from the kadosh ran back home saw that the fire is coming closer and closer and put itself out right next to his house fire ended right there and then before it reached his house showing clearly how Akadosh Baruch Hu not only loves the mitzvah of Bikat Amazon not only loves how mitzvah Bikat Amazon can give us chinuch can help us teach our kids teach ourselves but also loves emunat chachamim because he loves his chachamim when Akadosh Baruch Hu has these Chachamim that he sends to us, the toil and toil over Torah, in order to teach us the words of the Gaon Vilna, of how he toiled his whole life to bring us such emet, the words of the Ben Ishchai, of how he toiled his whole life. Akadosh Baruch Hu cares a lot about these Chachamim. When they say something and we listen to them, that in itself gives of the merit to have those blessings be fulfilled let us take the words of the sages seriously by first and foremost applying it to ourselves second helping our children listen to the, divre, divre the words of the sages helping them get to fulfilling the words of the sages and most importantly all of those that are around us that are not listening all of those that are unaware reach out to them reach out to them and try to get them to do tshuva but before you get to them 
before you say a word to them, regardless of who they are, make sure you've asked yourself and answered the question from yourself of why are you doing it? Not how you're going to do it, not when you're going to do it, but why are you doing it? And make sure that that answer of why you're going to help your friend, why you're going to educate your friend, why you're going to rebuke your friend, rebuke your son, rebuke your daughter, whoever it is, the why is because you love them. Because you love Hashem. Because you love the Torah. That should be the answer. When you do that, your words will work. Your strategy will work. The CD you give them will work. The link will work. Everything you do for the sake of heaven will work. Why? You have the right answer to the question why. And if we do that with Hashem's kids, Be'ezrat Hashem, Hashem will do it with our kids as well. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.